Chapter 20 Christmas came. Yadith liked Christmas, though it wasn't as much fun as some of the other festivals. People from the surrounding countryside came for Christmas Mass, so it was a time to see new people. Most people couldn't go to church each week, as her family did. In fact, most people in England lived many days' travel from a church, and only attended on Christmas and Easter. The evening before, some families from outlying farms had already arrived and pitched tents at the edge of the village. On Christmas morning, more people poured through the wooden gates of the monastery than could fit in the church. Many people stood outside the church during Mass. Everyone had been fasting until Mass was over, but then there was a feast in the monastery grounds. The monks didn't mix too closely with the villagers, but they donated some food and some ale, and Yadith ate until she was stuffed. That was the last time Yadith felt really full that winter. There seemed to be less food for the household week by week, there were now nine people on the farm, and even though the household had managed to store up a good amount of wheat from the harvest, and they had a big garden which gave them root vegetables and kale right up until the ground froze, the food stores went quickly. For a while they had had salted pork from the pig they had raised and slaughtered, but it ran out eventually. A few weeks after Christmas, Yadith asked her father whether he thought they would make it until spring. "'We'll be all right,' he said. "'We just need to make everything stretch a little farther.' Yadith began to take the job of trading firewood around the village more seriously. She and Gunhild would walk from house to house up the river to the wooden fence around the monastery grounds and then back again, setting up promises of firewood in exchange for food and agreeing on delivery dates. The families that were well established here often had some extra food, but it wasn't terribly hard to convince them to get firewood either if they needed it. They often traded for the sake of convenience, and sometimes out of pity. Sometimes the two girls were invited in for some bread, and Yadith related the tales of their voyage, though she often suspected she was benefiting from charity. In mid-January it snowed. It wasn't particularly a reason for celebration, and it was undeniably cold even in the house. But Yadith was excited to go play in the snow as she had when she was a child. She convinced Gunhild to throw snowballs with her, and they ambushed Leofwein and Sprott when they came out to join them. For the first time since they had returned, Yada saw Gunhild laugh. Back inside afterward, they drank hot water and huddled around the fire. Sprott asked for stories that he already knew well. Yadith knew them all, too. Stories about talking animals, kings and queens, elves and fairies. She told everyone her story about Godrich and Sea Pearl, and they all enjoyed it and offered their opinions on whether the prince would ever find Sea Pearl, and whether she ought to return. Boya told some riddles and made them guess the answers. Two sails have I, smooth and white, a great mast gracefully reaches. Often in pairs, partnered I sail. My song is sweet, sensing death. Yadith mulled this one over. Why two sails? she asked aloud. Do you give up? asked Sprott. No, hang on, she said. What ship has two sails? But they're not really sails, though, are they? Boya smiled and shrugged. Hang on, Yadith said. She repeated the riddle to herself. "'Can I tell her?' Sprott begged. Yadith reached out and pressed her hand against his mouth, which got a laugh from the family. "'A swan,' said Yadith suddenly. "'Of course, they live in pairs. But what about the singing?' "'A swan sings a beautiful song when it knows it's going to die,' said Boya. "'Didn't you know that?' Gunhild watched them all, trying to figure everyone out. Boya was clearly good-natured and an entertainer. He kidded and teased the others in the house, though he never interacted much with Gunhild. Leofwine was quieter and smiled less, though he clearly loved Sprott and was constantly teaching him how to do things with care and precision. Gunhild would watch him show Sprott how to sharpen an axe or splice a rope, and think of her mother teaching her to weave. Yadith's parents were both generally quiet. Winston had a sad look most of the time, except when he looked at Yadith. He was attentive to Madwin whenever they were in the house together, moving to give her a seat, giving her food first. Most of the time, however, Winston, like the other two men, was working, cutting wood, clearing land, digging ditches to help the field drain, repairing the house, or helping neighbors. From time to time, Gunhild slipped away from the house. 
Despite the cold, she would sometimes stay out for an hour or more, but always after chores were done. The first time Yadith noticed her friend was missing, she wondered where she might have gone, until she noticed that Gunhild's lyre was missing, too. She decided Gunhild needed some time alone and didn't go looking. After that, Gunhild disappeared occasionally, but the family never commented. After all, Gunhild, at fourteen, was almost grown and free to go where she chose. One evening, though, Gunhild was still out when it was time to eat, and Yadlu asked whether anyone had seen her. Yadith said that she could probably find her, and put on her warm cloak and hat to go look. She walked outside and paused, taking in the cool evening. Their farm was on the edge of the abbey's lands. To the west were meadows and forests, and no houses in sight. It might be a day's walk to reach another village or the encampments of shepherds who pastured their flocks nearby. Yadith began walking toward a copse of trees in the distance, and soon, as she expected, she heard music drifting through the air. She went closer, then paused to listen. It was beautiful, and Yadith could tell that Gunhild was developing some skill. After a few minutes, she continued walking, and at the noise of her approaching footsteps, the music stopped. It's just me, Yadith called. She reached the trees and found Gunhild sitting with the lyre. It's getting late, said Yadith. Gunhild stood up. You can play in the house, you know, Yadith said. You don't have to be out here. It's not the same, said Gunhild. When people listen, I'm only thinking about whether they like it. She paused. Do they actually want me here? Of course, said Yadith. Why would they? asked Gunhild. I'm not family. You can be, said Yadith, if you want. But I can't just decide to stay, said Gunhild. It's not my home. Yadith smiled sadly. I guess that's up to you, she said. A month went by, and they reached the beginning of Lent. Now they couldn't eat meat on any day except for Sunday. That didn't matter much, because the family's supply of pork was gone. In fact, most meals were wheat porridge or wheat bread, and only twice a day. I wish we could afford some fish, mentioned Madwin one day. Fish didn't count as meat in the church's view, so they could eat fish every day if they had it. We could get fish, said Yadith, realizing suddenly. She continued in English. Gunhild! We have the boat and the fishing nets. Let's go fish. Gunhild squinted at her, processing the sentence word by word. Let's go fish, she said carefully in English. Yes, said Yadith. Do you want to? Gunhild seemed to consider it, then smiled. Yes, she said. We will fish. The household stared in amazement. No one had heard Gunhild speak English before. Gunhild flushed, but couldn't avoid a proud smile as she and Yadith headed toward the door. The snow had long gone, but it was still a cold February day. Yadith and Gunhild took heavy cloaks and the wool hats that Madwin had sewn for them. As they walked the mile from their farm to the beach near the abbey where the boat was kept, Gunhild could feel the bounce in her step. She should have thought of this weeks ago, she decided. Yadith seemed excited, too. When they reached the boat and readied it, and then pushed off into the river, it felt to Gunhild as if they were back where they should be. They both pulled at the oars together, and sent the fairing up the esk and out toward the sea. Near the mouth of the river, they stopped and threw the fishing net over the side, then Gunhild unfurled the sail and it caught the wind. The sea was calm and it shimmered like glass. Villagers, seeing them from the shore, waved, and they waved back. Heading out into the sea, Gunhild found herself staring off into the distance, the shore at her back, thinking about what lay over the waters. In one direction, her home. In every other, new places with new people. New dangers, too, and she thought of how they had only just escaped freezing, drowning, and starvation. Nevertheless, when she turned back toward the shore, she felt a pang of regret. After an hour of sailing, they headed for calmer waters and pulled up the net, but found no fish in it. I know there must be fish here, said Yadith. Is it the wrong time of year? I'm not sure, said Gunhild. 
These waters aren't much like those where Uncle Ivor taught me. There could be different kinds of fish. Maybe the net needs to go deeper. If the net needs shallower water, we could try the river, Yadith suggested. Gunhild considered it. There was so much she didn't know. No reason not to try, she said, and throwing the net back in the water, unfurled the sail again and aimed the boat upriver. As Gunhild guided the boat, Yadith looked over the edge and into the water, trying to spot any fish. It wasn't long, however, before they saw something ahead of them stretching across the river. There was a barrier like a low fence extending out from one bank. It was a fishing weir, made out of stakes woven across with willow branches. The barrier was angled toward the flow of the river so that any fish going downstream would be pushed toward the shore. There, at the angle made where the weir met the shore, a group of people fished with lines and hooks. Yadith and Gunhild hadn't seen them before, but they had never walked along the stretch of the river. As they approached, Yadith waved, but could see the people were glaring at them already. Hello, she said. Catch anything? What do you think you're doing? One of the people called. The group looked like it could have been a family. There were at least five adults and a few children. The one shouting at her was one of the older women. You can't fish here, she continued. This is our spot. Sorry, called Yadith. Can we fish in the river and you fish from shore? Of course not, was the response. Every fish you catch is one thus for us. We have the rights for this river. The abbess said so. Yadith turned back to Gunhild and asked her to turn about. Sorry again, she shouted, waving as they retreated. They continued downriver until they were out of sight of the group, and Yadith explained to Gunhild what the woman had said. Gunhild, worried that she would somehow turn the village against her, felt ashamed, but Yadith was fuming. How is that fair? she demanded. They don't own the river. They can't claim fish they haven't even caught yet. It's okay, said Gunhild. We can go somewhere else. Here, let's check the net. They hauled in the net, Yadith still muttering, and to Gunhild's delight found a brown trout. There was only one, but it was a decent size. It was a dinner for one person, at least. Well, of course there's only one, said Yadith. The rest are trapped behind that weir. Gunhild put her hand on Yadith's arm. If there's one, there are more. Let's keep going. She picked up the trout. Do you want to whack this one? No thanks, said Yadith. Are you sure? asked Gunhild. Let some frustration out. Here, smack it. Not in the mood, said Yadith. Gunhild dispatched the trout, then tossed the net overboard again. Then she moved to sit beside Yadith in the back of the boat. Without saying anything, she handed Yadith the rope that controlled the sail. She took Yadith's other hand and put it on the tiller, and then reaching behind her so she could guide each hand, helped Yadith sail further downstream and make a big loop around the harbor. They stayed this way, making circles in the boat, saying nothing but listening to the waves and the sound of gulls. Gunhild kept her arm around Yadith even after Yadith was steering confidently. She felt a sense of peace she hadn't felt for months, even years. After some time, she took her arm away and picked up the fish from the bottom of the boat. Hwa is this fish? she asked in English. Yadith smiled. This fish is trut. Antrut, twa trut. They returned home with five brown trout, to great excitement from the household. As Gunhild showed their catch, Yadlu made a big fuss of how big and good-looking they were. Madwin smiled and patted Gunhild on the shoulder when she came near. Sprott picked up a fish and held it up in celebration. They cooked the fish immediately and ate them as soon as they were ready. They tasted better than Gunhild could have imagined. It was the first protein they had had in weeks. After the fish were picked clean, the family stayed around the fire, talking and smiling. Gunhild stayed with them, trying to keep up with the conversation, offering a word or two where she could. "'Did you fish at home?' Duna asked. "'Yes, many fish,' said Gunhild. "'In boat with uncle. Much sailing. Much fishing.' As the family continued to chat around the fire, Gunhild's mind lingered on the water. When they took the boat out the next day, Yadith and Gunhild made sure not to sail too far up the river— but still they often saw people from the shore. That week they always managed at least a few fish a day, mostly trout, but sometimes they caught a tench or some eels. Occasionally they saw other villagers fishing in the harbor, but never any further up the river. A few days later they found out why. 
One morning, while Eadeth and Gunhild were splitting wood, a monk in a long brown robe walked up and asked to speak to the father of the girls in the boat. The women were doing morning chores while the men were away, so Eadeth went to get her mother, while Gunhild waited awkwardly, trying not to stare at the monk, but not wanting to ignore him either. He was a short man, clean-shaven, with a fringe of wispy, curly hair around the edge of his head. He seemed determined to ignore Gunhild, too, preferring to wait until he could speak to someone with authority. When Eadeth returned with her mother, he said, "'Are you the ones who have been fishing in the river without permission?' "'My daughter fishes,' said Madwin. "'She and her friend to do.' "'I'm Brother Calling,' said the monk. "'I am the prior. Did you know the river belongs to the abbey, and the abbey must give its permission?' Madwin looked abashed. "'We only arrived here last spring, Brother Prior,' she said. Gunhild couldn't understand exactly what was being said, but she hated the monk's supercilious air. Yadith was even more incensed. She knew that Brother Calling was essentially their landlord, but it bothered her that no one from the abbey had ever come to visit their family or check in on them that she knew of until it was to reprimand them. And now the prior was making her mother grovel while he looked down his nose at her. The abbey owns the river as it does the fields and woods beyond. Tenants who use the resources of the abbey must do so with permission and pay part of whatever they produce. Where did those logs come from? The forest nearby, said Madwin. You will deliver one-tenth of all wood cut to the abbey for its use. As for the fishing, the family of Ostrida the fisher has the rights. You must stay beyond the mouth of the river. Understood? Madwin said that she did understand, and Brother Calling turned and walked away. Yadith glared after him. It wouldn't have killed him to be polite about it, she muttered. At least he didn't find us anything, said her mother. Gunhild asked Yadith to explain what had happened afterward, and was horrified to find that because of the fishing, the family's firewood business had been discovered, and now they would have less to trade. Gunhild, and sometimes Yadith too, still went fishing from time to time, but the catch was never quite as good. Nevertheless, her ability to contribute food to the family seemed to encourage her to interact with them more, too, and to practice her English. When she tore her dress, she asked Madwin for a needle and thread to sew it, and she even figured out a game with Sprott where he would call out the name of an object in English, and they would both race to touch it first. One day Alfred, who came to see Duna, approached the house. Gunhild was outside grinding flour in the corn. She had never spoken to Alfred directly, but now she greeted him. "'Good morning,' she called. "'Good morning,' he replied. "'Is Boya here?' "'He cuts tree,' said Gunhild. "'Duna is there, at the garden.' Alfred thanked her and went to see Duna. He seemed nervous, Gunhild thought. Later the men returned, pulling a tree on the sledge, and Gunhild and Yadith watched Alfred walk up to Boya hesitantly. "'Boya,' he asked, "'may I talk to you?' Boya smiled broadly at Alfred. Of course, he said, but I can't possibly stop to talk until this log is bucked and stacked. Grab an axe. Alfred complied, and together the men chopped the log into lengths. Gunhild noticed that for some reason the rest of the household had gathered to watch. When the job was complete, Alfred approached Boya again, who acted surprised to see he was still there. I would like to talk to you, Boya, said Alfred. Oh, of course, Boya replied, but that was sweaty work, and I would like to wash my face and neck first. Alfred looked slightly uncertain, but said, Of course. Yadlu, said Boya, do we have any water to wash with? All the household looked at Yadlu, who was repressing a smile. No, we don't, she said. Next to her, Duna was glaring sharply at her father. Alfred, lad, grab that bucket and get some water from the river, would you? said Boya. Then we can talk. Alfred looked uncertain, but he nodded and took the bucket and walked off. As soon as he was gone, Duna ran up to Boya. Father, she hissed in a furious whisper, what are you doing? You know why he wants to talk to you. Of course, whispered Boya, don't ruin it. Duna stamped her foot in frustration and returned to stand next to her mother. Alfred returned quickly with a bucket of water and handed it to Boya, who washed his face and neck with exaggerated enjoyment. Everyone was still watching. Thank you, said Boya. He paused and looked at Alfred. Did you need something? To talk to you, said Alfred. Of course, of course, said Boya. We should get comfortable. 
He sat down on a nearby log and proceeded to pull off his boots. His second boot seemed to be stuck, and he held it out to Alfred. Alfred looked more confused, but compliantly pulled off the boot. Boya pulled off his thick felt socks and wiggled his toes in the air. He glanced over at Leofwine, whose eyes remained impassive, but who kept a hand over his mouth, as if deep in thought. Alfred, said Boya, it's been a hard morning, and my feet are so tired. I don't suppose you could give the old toes a rub while you're talking. Thanks ever so much. Alfred stood staring, clearly unsure what to do. He looked back and forth from Boya's bare foot held aloft to the surrounding faces watching him. Without warning, a laugh echoed across the farm. Leofwine had lost his composure and doubled over in laughter, at which Boya himself and the rest of the family did the same. Only Alfred and Duna stayed silent, Alfred confused and Duna annoyed. Boya, still laughing, stood up and slung an arm around Alfred's shoulders. "'Sorry, was there something you wanted to tell me?' said Boya. Alfred, starting to realize he was the butt of the joke, smiled and relaxed. "'I want to marry your daughter,' he said. "'Well, why didn't you say so in the first place instead of wasting your time cutting wood?' howled Boya, and he again collapsed in gales of laughter. Duna ran up to Alfred and kissed him, then turned to her father. "'You're horrible,' she said, but she was smiling too now. Boya put his boots on and everyone went inside, and Yadlu passed out flatbread, which was the only food in the house. "'I would offer you a cup of ale,' Boya said to Alfred, "'but we haven't had ale in the house since the summer. "'As you can see, we don't have much. "'What do you have to offer her if she marries you?' I'm building a new house next to my own family's, said Alfred. There's meadowland nearby that I've been clearing all winter and it's ready to be plowed. And my family will give us a young pig. Boya nodded, considering. And what do you ask of her family? I, I don't... Alfred stammered. He tried to phrase his words correctly so as not to draw attention to what everyone already knew. Duna's family had nothing to give. She is all I need, he said. He turned to look at Duna as he spoke. She is more than a lord's treasure. She is more than the riches of Rome. To have her... He paused, and there was a distinct sniffle from Yadlu as she tried to hold back tears. She is all I could ever ask for. Boya smiled and brought his hand down on Alfred's knee. You're a good man, he said, and I know you love her. Do you have the wood for your house? Not yet, said Alfred. Then I will provide your beams and your trusses, and I will help you build. My daughter will have a fine house on the day she's married. At this they stood up, and everyone began to talk at once and go around the house hugging each other. It was agreed that the families would eat together on Sunday, and that Alfred and Duna should be married as soon as the house was built. Alfred left, beaming happily, and the rest of the family fell to talking about the wedding and plans for the spring. It'll be nice to have a little extra space in the house, Boya said jovially. I wonder if we can get rid of some of the others the same way. Sprott, when are you going to build a house and get out of your uncle's hair? Sprott laughed at the idea. And you, Winston, Boya started. I'm already married, Winston joked. No, I mean, when some young man comes calling for Yadith, are you going to bring yourself to part with her? What if I don't plan to get married, said Yadith. Well, there you go, said Boya to Winston. You'll never get rid of her now. Tell me, Yadith, if you don't get married, who will do the plowing? I can manage a plow, I'm sure, said Yadith. The ox does all the work, right? Leofwine and Boya shook their heads pityingly. Well, Gunhild can help me, Yadith continued. Two women can do the work of one man. Plowing's not the only thing you need a man for, though, said Boya. I don't see what else, said Yadith. Think hard, said Boya, grinning. Shame on you, his wife told him. Yadith blushed, but didn't back down. Well, who says I want a baby anyway, she said. What if I just want to farm? Doing nothing but farming would be boring, said Sprott. I could spin, said Yadith. I could make pots, go fishing, make beer, weave cloth. I could keep bees, make cheese, carve wood. She was counting off options on her fingers. And whenever I wanted to, I could relax, go for a walk, pick flowers, talk to my friends. She looked over at Gunhild. I don't need a husband for any of that. Well, I guess you're stuck with her, Winston, said Boya merrily. Anyway, enough talk. There's wood to chop, and if we're going to start shaping timbers for building, that's even more to do. The men went outside, and Yadith and Gunhild retreated to their straw pile and lay down. They stayed there for a while, listening to the work going on outside. For a few moments they remained lost in thought, until Gunhild broke the silence. 
Do you really not want to get married? she asked, switching back to Danish. I don't know, said Yadith. I just don't see the point. You and I could live together. Our own house, our own farm. She looked over at Gunhild as if gauging her reaction. Gunhild could imagine what Yadith had in mind. Two friends together, sharing everything, no one else being in charge. Something about a house and a farm seemed wrong, though. Wrong for her, at least. If she built a house and planted a field, she would be stuck here. This village, these people, this tiny corner of the world. Whether it was with a husband or with Yadith or on her own, she wasn't sure she could do that. Why me? she asked Yadith. What happens when you fall in love with a man? Yadith thought for a bit. There's an English word, Breostord. Can you figure out what it means? Gunhild thought about it and shook her head. It means heart treasure, Yadith explained. It's your thoughts and feelings. It's everything that you are inside. She paused. You know my heart treasure. You know it unlike anyone else. That's all I want. 